What is going on, everyone? We have made it to draft season. We are here with my first of what's going to be many mock drafts on the channel leading up to April's draft. Do make sure you are subscribed so you don't miss the mock drafts, the position rankings, you name it. Draft season is the best time of the year, and I'm just glad we're here. I had a ton of fun putting this mock draft together. Just a couple notes. We will have trades here. Uh, and this is, as most of my mock drafts are, a what I would do mock draft. Trying to put myself in the GM chair of all 32 teams and make the best decision for each team. But without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. And uh, please do hit that like button as we do. Uh, but, you know, it, it, with this number one pick, with the Chicago Bears sitting here, <laughs> It's, I guess, a discussion, but for me, it's it's not. And the number one thing I think I'm going to keep coming to until the Bears inevitably, in my opinion, make the decision to move off of fields and draft Caleb Williams is the thing I see all the time is like the bird in the hand is worth two in the bush debate with Justin Fields, where, yes, we saw some growth from Justin Fields. He's a starting caliber NFL quarterback. He has not been a bust of a draft pick. He's probably the 19th best quarterback in the NFL, maybe 25th, uh, depending on what sort of lens you want to put on it. And sure, some weeks he does incredible things and looks like a top 10 quarterback certain weeks with his incredible traits, but with his deficiencies as a passer, his, his inability to see the field, play on time, get through his progressions, and just consistently operate the passing game, those are legitimate problems with Justin Fields. And while you might say, what if Caleb Williams is a bust? Sure, maybe there's a 2 or a 3% chance that Caleb really is just a bust. He's the next Zach Wilson, and that's a shame if that happens. But that's drafting out of fear. You look at Caleb Williams' profile, there's not a whole lot to tell you that he's going to be a bust. I made a whole video about this whole thing if you want to check it out. Um, but you're not just drafting trying to get back to the fields level, right? You're drafting to hopefully get a guy that can now go head-to-head -head with Jordan Love that looks incredible. Go head-to-head -head with the Detroit Lions in your own division, let alone find a quarterback that can year in, year out, play it at a top 10 level or so, and be a true championship-caliber quarterback. And yeah, Fields has theoretical upside with his physical tools, but I mean, in my opinion, the probability of Justin Fields becoming a top 10 quarterback pales in comparison to the probability of, Ju of Caleb Williams being a top five quarterback. That's the type of upside we're talking about with Caleb Williams. So it needs to be reiterated that there's risk, sure, with Caleb Williams and any prospect coming out of college, but there's risk with Justin Fields too. So I'm not going to have this debate every single time, but this did need to be brought to the forefront as it is our first mock draft. I don't think the Bears are going to make us wait until draft day to figure this out. I um, mean, the flip side of this here in this mock draft is I'm going to send Justin Fields somewhere because that's going to change the need for a different team. Um, we're going to go with the kind of big favorite for this and that's to the Atlanta Falcons with all those playmakers send him back home to Atlanta where he's from and this also makes sense because the Falcons have a very valuable pick that I think is right around the value of Justin Fields which is like probably an early second round pick which is that number 43 pick we're also going to fetch a future fourth from the Falcons so you know that's the one last note on this that I'll say is it's not it's not like oh it's it's you're either taking Fields and a Hall or Caleb Williams. No, because of the way Fields has played and that he he might have a, a future still in the NFL, um, you know, it's Caleb plus picks as well. It's not as many picks as you'd get for number one, but the Bears roster is actually in pretty good shape. So um, that plus the rookie quarterback contract, there's just so many reasons to go with Caleb Williams. And I think Bears fans are slowly, you know, the further we're removed from Justin Fields going out there on Sundays, the more Bears fans are realizing that they're going to forget about Justin Fields pretty quickly, I think, with, with Caleb Williams. But let's move on to Washington at number two. And this one's much more straightforward for me. It's uh, Drake May to the Washington Commanders. I think this one's going to be pretty set in stone as well, especially if they hire presumed 
uh, uh, presumably Ben Johnson. It just makes so much sense. You get the talented young quarterback, the talented young offensive coordinator. You put them together and build from there. It's a, it's a very high upside approach to put those two together, and it would be a ton of fun. Um, so I, I do want to say as we get into this, I haven't – finished my evaluations on all of these players that we'll have in this mock draft, but I have begun my research and I think I'm more prepared for my first mock draft of the season than I've ever been. Um, I do have my evaluations up on my Patreon where you can get access to my full draft guide. You can read all about what I have on Drake May and and all these top quarterbacks. Uh, We also have exclusive content. J.J. McCarthy first look film breakdown is up there. Uh, We're going to be doing seven round mock drafts for uh, every team in the NFL in April. So lots of great exclusive content. You can support my channel in the process uh, because this is the first mock draft. I just want to remind you guys uh, that there is a lot more draft content out there for me if you enjoy, you want to support my channel. It's patreon.com slash that franchise guy. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll be having plenty more conversations about what I really think about Drake May. At the end of the day, I think there's a pretty clear gap between him and Caleb and then him and uh, the other quarterbacks in this draft and uh, my next draft video is going to be uh, well I guess I'll be covering the senior bowl next week but when I get back from the senior bowl um, it'll be my quarterback ranking so we'll have a very laid out evaluation on Drake May but I think number two here makes a lot of sense anyway enough blabbering let's get to the number three pick and uh, this one is going to be I think heavily debated and I don't know that we'll know our answer on this one until draft day. And this one is going to reshape a lot in this draft um, because they could go quarterback, probably with Jaden Daniels here, or they could take the hot commodity kind of blue chip Marvin Harrison Jr., who is a generational wide receiver prospect, in my opinion. And if this is me drafting, I would rather take Marvin, start to build up this offensive core as opposed to throw Jaden Daniels into this thing. And it's not that I don't think Jaden Daniels could be worth the number three pick to the right spot, um, but I do think he has a lot of work to grow. And you put him in there with a, a shaky offensive line, a wide receiver group that is in shambles right now. Man, I don't really like that for Jaden Daniels. I don't like that for New England. I don't like that for Mayo, your new head coach. For me, let's let's bring in Marvin. um, Look at this a little bit more of a longer window rebuild here. Maybe next year is a quarterback. um, Or maybe second round is a quarterback because you've now pushed the quarterback depth down the draft a little bit instead of taking one at three so um for me it it is a relatively easy decision to take marvin harrison um, but it's certainly going to be debated and you guys will have to let me know in the comments down below where you're going uh with this number three pick for new england uh we won't have to wait too long before we talk about Jaden daniels as we'll see here um, but for arizona at number four i know a lot of cardinals fans are like oh man the patriots took marvin harrison and i get it Marvin's incredible. I've been dreaming of seeing Kyler Murray throw to Marvin Harrison back before I was trying to tell people that Kyler's going to play himself back into the franchise quarterback position here when everyone was making Call of Duty jokes. So believe me, I get it. But now that I have seen Malik Neighbors, I tweeted this out. He's the best wide receiver prospect I've seen since I've been doing this in 2016 not named Marvin Harrison. His biggest weakness is he's in the same draft class as Marvin Harrison. Taking Malik Neighbors at number four is an easy decision. He is big. He is fast. He is elusive and quick and creative after the catch. He's an excellent route runner. He gets off the ball. He's got great hands. He's He checks the age mark. He's 21 years old. Like, There is so much to like about Malik Neighbors. In fact, you could even argue he's got a higher physical upside than Marvin Harrison. And at least early on, I think Malik Neighbors would probably outproduce Marvin in New England catching balls from, I don't know, Sam Darnold. (laughs) Like, trust me, this is not a consolation prize in Malik Neighbors. I have him incredibly highly rated, and I am more than happy to rush this pick to the podium if I'm Arizona, and this is a really exciting group of playmakers now with 
Trey McBride breaking out. You've got other wide receiver options, guys like um, Wilson and Rondale Moore. Um, the offensive line's solid. I like the play caller on what he showed and Drew Petzing in year one. And, and the Cardinals are getting a lot of hype as like a potential playoff team next year. I think Malik Neighbors can be a big part of that. So um, that's a fun one. Let's move on to the number five pick. And with Marvin and Malik Neighbors, that makes this decision a lot easier. Now, I have seen Roma Dunze here at number five. It's a little rich for me, and I think he's he's pretty redundant. He's an, He would be another one of these kind of Keenan Allen, Joshua Palmer types. I like Adunze a lot, but he's not like this super athlete that I, I think the Chargers wish they had. Take Joe Alt. I think he's athletic enough to switch over to right tackle in terms of like hand-eye coordination. Like I don't think that would be a problem. Um, just have bookend have a bookend tackle duo. You know Harbaugh is going to want to run the ball. I think Alt is a fantastic run blocker with ridiculous athleticism. A lot of his highlight blocks remind me of Mike McGlinchey uh, coming out of Notre Dame. You know, a six foot seven super athlete. But I think Alt's a much better pass protector than Mike McGlinchey was. So especially with those top two receivers gone, pretty easy pick for the Chargers. Love this for Herbert. Love this for for Harbaugh. Let that offense cook. Uh, all right, at number six for the New York Giants. This one, uh, I'm curious what what you guys think. I'm curious what Giants fans think as I'm going to trade down out of this spot. And I'm curious what Pittsburgh Steelers fans think with me trading up a pretty hefty trade package to come up and get Jaden Daniels, the quarterback out of LSU. Um, So let's break this down from each team's perspective. For the New York Giants, you know, I certainly would understand if you say, well, take Olu Fashano. He can play right tackle. And hopefully the other pieces kick it up a notch. I I would understand that. Now, there's more to it than that. I I think if you're the Giants, number one, to get a trade haul for a quarterback. In this situation, we're getting the Steelers' first-round pick next year. You're getting a third and a fourth-round pick this year. You're getting the 20th pick in this draft where there will still be wide receivers and offensive linemen available. And we're going to get a third round pick from them next year. So we are getting a haul from the Steelers to help fill out this um, this roster. And that extra first round pick next year could be draft capital to go and make a play for a quarterback next year when this team is in a better spot. So I think this just positions the Giants much better for their future. This team is not going to come in and be a Super Bowl winning team this year. As good of a pick as Olu Fushanu would be here. I'm totally cool if you say let's stay put and make this pick. Number one, we don't know if Fashanu can slide over to right tackle seamlessly. You also have invested there. You still have Evan Neal. They just brought in the Raiders offensive line coach, Carmen Brasillo. They found Tyree Phillips from the Eagles practice squad who played well in the second half of the year. There's cautious optimism that you could shape this thing back up next year, especially with Still more picks to spend on that offensive line. Personally, Roma Dunze is not worth this pick compared to the haul you're going to get here. So I like having all of these options and flexibility for the Giants. As for the Steelers, I mean, they've made their bed here when they chose to play Mason Rudolph over Kenny Pickett in that playoff game. If Kenny Pickett isn't good enough to play over Mason Rudolph in a playoff game in year two, he's not your guy, right? So, like, they've made their bed there. You have Mike Tomlin kind of on the hot seat in terms of, like, where is this going to go? This is a team that's never really going to be in a position to draft a quarterback super high. You kind of have to make a play for this. And you put Jaden Daniels here with these receivers, with George Pickens and his deep ball ability, with Jaden Daniels, who, if nothing else, is going to ignite this offense with his um, his running ability and scrambling ability. You pair that with a defense that you have pretty pretty big expectations for. I thought this team drafted well last year. This is not a team with a lot of needs outside of the quarterback position. I feel like I don't even really need to sell Steelers fans on this, but I am curious if Steelers fans are against this. But I think you look at the window that this team has, you need a, you need an electric quarterback to compete in this division. Um, and they're kind of just treading water right now. Let's make a splash. Let's see if Jaden T- Daniels can be a hit for the Steelers. And if he's not, if he's a bust, so be it. You can eventually just kind of open up a new window, be bad for a little bit, 
but let's at least go for it in Pittsburgh. And I think Mike Tomlin's ready for that too. I think Mike Tomlin is starting to get a little bit tired of fl- just, you know, scrapping out nine and eight win seasons every year. So I, I really like that one. You guys will have to let me know. Um, the number seven pick, Tennessee Titans, Olu Fushanu. The Andre Dillard signing at left tackle was a disaster this year. Plug him in at left tackle. Great scheme fit as it's going to be a lot more of a drop back passing game now with Levis and Callahan. If Fashanu's there, you're just popping champagne for Tennessee. This would be a dream for them. Really um, clean pass protector that they desperately need. Then the Atlanta Falcons at number eight, who just went um, and got their quarterback, Justin Fields. You've got a offensive, uh, sorry, a defensive head coach now. Um, but what you don't have is any edge rushers in Atlanta. It, it you know, um, Ebicady hasn't been an impact. The veterans that have been playing there, let's go get your choice of the best edge rusher in this class. And this is something that, you know, I haven't really dove into this edge class yet, um, but just my early impressions is Dallas Turner, the guy that is getting better at a young age that has the freak athletic traits. He, to me, is the guy that you take in the top 10 and hope that the development can be there with a good coaching staff in Atlanta. But I, I think this fills the need. And the rest of your roster is in pretty good shape. And if he hits, look out for that Falcons defense. Uh, then at number nine, the Chicago Bears. Um, this is where we get Roma Dunze. And this just plays out so well because after quarterback, I think wide receiver two is the biggest need for the Chicago Bears, especially with Darnell Mooney leaving in free agency. Um, but Adunze is the perfect pairing with a DJ Moore. DJ Moore is your your alpha, the guy you can design the offense through, the run-after-catch monster. Adunze as a number two, I love. I don't know that Adunze is going to be a dominant, like, number one wide receiver, but with with him as, like, a just a great possession receiver, you know, my comp for him is Roddy White, who kind of eventually needed his Julio Jones to be opposite of him. Keenan Allen's another guy. I mean, Keenan Allen's kind of a quasi-one. Um, but just think of a reliable contested catch guy, possession guy, someone to work those back shoulders with, with Caleb, someone that's excellent at reading and reacting and scramble drill to, uh, find those opening spots in the zone. It, it wasn't a ton of that with Penix, but when Penix did scramble, you saw Odunze very quickly looking around, trying to find those open spots. So really like this fit with Caleb within this offense. Then at number 10, the New York Jets. You're just praying one of these top offensive tackles is there for you, whether it's Alt, Fashanu, that's probably uh, a pipe dream. But uh, luckily for the Jets, it sounds like both uh, Talese Fuaga and Troy Fotno are really good tackle prospects. I haven't gotten into Fuaga's tape uh, yet, but I've heard really good things. He's a right tackle, which I would argue the Jets need um more than left tackle they need them both but you know you're hoping maybe between Dwayne Brown and Makai Becton you can get a healthy season at left tackle between the two of them and then t- uh, Talise Fuaga can come in and, and kind of be their Darnell Wright at right tackle uh with this number 10 pick very I think similar style of prospect from what I've what I've heard and I'm really excited to see Fuaga uh next week at the Senior Bowl then we got the Minnesota Vikings at 11 and I really struggled with this one Um, And they're obviously a unique conversation. At this point in time, if we're sending fields to Atlanta, I think Kirk is back in Minnesota. I I think that's going to be as between Atlanta and Minnesota. That's where Kirk's going to want to be. And I think Minnesota is going to be willing to give Kirk a contract. It's just a matter of are other teams like willing to sell their soul for Kirk Cousins. And in this scenario, I, I don't have that happening. Maybe that does end up happening if fields goes elsewhere. Um, but in this world, Kirk is back. It's not that the Vikings aren't looking for a quarterback, but I definitely don't think with those top three guys, you need to spend the 11th pick on that quarterback. You have trade-up scenarios potentially avail- available for you later. I will say I really like Michael Penix as a fit there, but I really don't think, especially based on what people are saying the NFL views Michael Penix as, as more of a day two type of quarterback, I just don't think you have to spend the 11th pick on him. You want to trade up to 32 or whatever and go get your guy with a fifth-year option, I I would be totally game for that. And We'll see if we do that later in the mock draft. But uh, with the 11th pick, I'm looking edge rusher. I'm looking interior defensive line. 
as like the value positions to invest in here for for Minnesota. And the guy settled on here was Jared Verse out of Florida State. Have not really dove into his film yet, so I don't have like nuanced opinions on him yet. But I do look at that roster with Daniil Hunter is a pending free agent. But even if they bring Hunter back, you know, DJ Wanham can't be your number two edge. So let's bring in Verse. And then with the number 12 pick, the Denver Broncos, I love this fit the more I think about it. And I could totally picture this. Bo Nix to the Denver Broncos. You've made your bed with Russell Wilson. He's gone, but you can't go into the year with Jarrett Stidham. Why not just stay put at 12, get your guy here that for me, Bo Nix is a legit first round quarterback prospect. He's not a perfect quarterback. I don't think he'll ever be an elite guy. Um, but I definitely think he can be a top half starter in the league. He he takes care of the ball. He is brilliant in structure. The way he's developed his game from what he was at Auburn, where he is he is just a surgeon within that first read, gets the ball out on time. And Sean Payton is going to create open first reads for Bo Nix. So he is, I think, going to do a really good job of running Payton's system in a way that Russ, that's not really Russ, right? Like. I'm sure there's a lot of times where Peyton's drawn up first reads and Russ is like not seeing it or holding the ball. That's not Nick's. Nick's is if it's there, he's hitting it automatically. Love that about him. And then, okay, he doesn't have ideal pocket presence. He can bail out of clean pockets. Um, but that's when he goes back to his Auburn self and then he'll improvise. He's actually very similar to Brock Purdy. And some people are going to scoff at that. Uh, but that's a huge compliment. And if you're in a spot like Denver where you don't expect to be picking top five and have a, a shot at a great quarterback, I think Bo Nix can come in, be a starter for you immediately, be a great fit for Sean Payton's offense. And on a cheap five-year deal, you now have a very clear window with all of the other picks and the cap space that's coming to build around Bo Nix. So probably going to be a polarizing pick. Broncos fans, you let me know what you think about this one. Um, but let's stay interdivision with the 13th pick, the Las Vegas Raiders. Uh, I went offensive line for them. I look at the right side of their O-line, and uh, they may be able to bring back Jermaine Illuminor. But even if they don't, Greg Van Roten was a right guard, uh, kind of a Band-Aid veteran that played well. But um, I just that, to me, is going to be their biggest need, is the right side of the line. And that's why I really like Troy Fontenot as a pick here for them because he can play guard he can play tackle he's got that kind of hybrid build i think he could slide over and play right tackle right guard for you in a heartbeat and i also think with carmen brasillo leaving i don't think you can just pencil in that this team's going to be able to keep getting these out of nowhere guys to step up i think it makes sense to invest in your o-line um with with a great coach like that leaving uh, but then with the 14th pick, the New Orleans Saints, a, a team that I just continue to struggle to analyze because they seem so content to be in the middle. Um, you know the Saints aren't trading down, most likely. That's uh, not Mickey Loomis's thing, um, though I certainly thought about it. I, I didn't necessarily see any trade partners here. But um, we're going to stay put and take Jerzon Newton, uh, who I still need to complete my evaluation on, but I've liked what I've seen from him as a three-down do-it-all uh, D lineman. Uh, this certainly fits their system. I, I think you could probably draw draw a lot of parallels uh, between him and David Onyemata, who was here, but is no longer here. Uh, I like the Brian Brzee pick, but you need two interior guys, right? So I know it's teams don't, uh, fans don't love when their team goes the same position back to back, but when there's two starters at that position, why not? If it's a need, it's a need. So uh, it seems like a, a pretty solid landing spot for Newton. Uh, and then for the Colts at 15, got to go cornerback here. I, I like that you get Brent's back, but uh, we need more talent in that room. And I'm going to go with Nate Wiggins, the cornerback out of Clemson. I have seen a couple games from him uh, from watching some of these ACC quarterbacks, and I, I just don't I don't get what's not to like about him. He's long. He's quick. He can play man. He can play zone. Um, physical guy. Has that confectious energy about him. So I wouldn't be stunned if he ends up my cornerback one. That's far from set in stone. Uh, but definitely with that length in a Gus Bradley defense, uh, put this thing over the edge um, to go Nate Wiggins here. And then with the Seattle Seahawks at 16, I didn't know which direction to go with, with this team. You could go with a young quarterback like J.J. McCarthy, sit him, stash him. I'm not the biggest J.J. McCarthy guy. I mean, sure. Uh, why not just keep doing this for Seattle? Just Let's just bring in Brock Bowers. I mean, why the F not? 
it is a need. Noah Fant is a pending free agent. Um, and my dude, Kobe Parkinson, is a pending free agent. So right now, they're blocking tight end as their only tight end. Brock Bauer is a special playmaker, man. He's a player I'm very familiar with. I haven't completed his evaluation. But, dude, who cares who your quarterback is when you have DK Metcalf, Jackson Smith and Jigba, Tyler Lockett, Brock Bowers, uh, Kenneth Walker. I, I don't know that you're drafting a tackle here that you think is an upgrade from Abraham Lucas. There's not really any like interior guys. Like I would, I would definitely go with Fatnu if he was here, but he's not. So why not make this a Brock Bowers spot and just laugh about it? Because I could see it happening and this would just be such a superpower of offensive weaponry. I mean, I mean, that's like trying to recreate what you're dealing with in San Francisco uh, every week with all the playmakers. And then the Jacksonville Jaguars at pick 17. Uh, it's got to be a wide receiver for me. I don't expect Ridley to be back when they have an incentive to let him go and how disappointing he was in certain weeks. Uh, I'm going to go with Brian Thomas Jr. right now as the fourth wide receiver off the board in this situation. Uh, I do think his verticality on the outside is something that this team has really missed, and they were hoping that Ridley could bring that consistently um, but just wasn't quite there on those goal balls and those deep posts that Trevor is brilliant at throwing. Brian Thomas Jr. is kind of that freaky deep threat build. 6'3", probably going to run in the four threes. He's got a good release off the line of scrimmage. Uh, was a beast for, for Malik Neighbors. Uh, it's a pretty easy pick here to put him with, with Trevor Lawrence. Then the Cincinnati Bengals at 18. Uh, I'm going to go with Amarius Mims, the right tackle out of Georgia. This is going to be a big opening for the, the Bengals this offseason with Jonah Williams set for free agency. And, um, you know, I think they're pretty content to just kind of let this board play out. There's a lot of guys that they could go uh, in this draft around that 18 spot. J.C. Latham, another option. Maybe guys like Fuaga and Fatnu are there. There's also a lot of hype for uh, Guyton, the Oklahoma tackle that we're going to see at the Senior Bowl next week. So this definitely feels like a likely offensive tackle spot uh, to give Joe Burrow some some protection. And we got to keep Burrow upright, right? And then the Rams at number 19. It, it's so weird to have a first round pick for the L.A. Rams. Uh, but I'm going to go with a cornerback, Terion Arnold, a freak athlete, a young player. The Rams are probably ecstatic to get their hands on a moldable ball of clay like this. Um, you know, they just they haven't had an opportunity to stumble upon a freak athlete, 21 year old prospect um, with a top 20 pick. They just they've been giving away these picks for a long time and. You, you can feel it in that secondary. They've scrapped together some some good players, but they need a shot at a great player out there and a, and a potential number one corner. I think that could be Terry on Arnold someday. And then the New York Giants, where they traded down to number 20, and we are still going to go with an offensive lineman. And another reason I did this is I think you look at J.C. Latham being a pick here, someone to target with this 20th pick that – Maybe could be here, but again, maybe this could be Fuaga or maybe this could be um, Troy Fotno. I, I just I, the Giants got to find a a best of five group, and whether that's taking a tackle and playing him at tackle, or taking a Latham and playing him at guard with Phillips or Neal at tackle. You know, Neal is six foot seven. I don't know that he'll necessarily be able to play guard, um, but I think taking Latham in a way actually makes I can't say it makes more sense than taking Fashanu but when you take Latham plus all these picks just the the flexibility with fixing the O-line with all the picks that what it, this opens the door for for your quarterback room in the future it just I really like this for the Giants so I hope Giants fans I've sold you on trading this far down um, but let's get to Miami with the 21st pick and this is where I am gonna have another trade I, I look at Miami and they are biggest need is offensive line interior offensive line specifically but the remaining offensive linemen feel like a reach or in the case of like a cody barton um he's six foot seven i don't think you're taking him to slide inside they also i didn't even realize they extended uh austin jackson at right tackle so he's going nowhere at right tackle for them so i'm gonna trade down here for miami not too far we're going to move down uh, with the Green Bay Packers. Um, it's going to be a, a you're going to get their third round pick, the 91st pick, and you're going to flip uh, sixth and fifth round picks there for Miami to move down four spots. And then for Green Bay, you are jumping 
some really like DB needy teams here to go get a guy that is a missing piece for this secondary Cooper DeGene, the defensive back extraordinaire. I love him as a slot corner for the Packers. It's a huge weakness for them. They've had Keyshawn Nixon trying to play there. And, you know, the nice thing about this is, okay, so maybe Eric Stokes can stay healthy and be a good player on the outside. Maybe Valentine continues to get better and you've got three good corners there. DeGene is a guy that can step back and play safety for you if you want him to do that. Or, you know, it gives you flexibility too, where like, okay, Stokes and Carrington Valentine aren't the answer on the outside. I think DeGene can play outside. So the Packers have this massive it, like their roster is in really good shape but they have like three needs in the secondary and DeGene I think is a slam dunk uh to just lock in one of those starting positions and I'm willing to part with a third round pick to go up and make sure you secure that guy when you have teams like Philadelphia and Houston who are going to be looking to um make uh cornerback picks which we'll see here with Philadelphia at number 22, Kool-Aid McKinnistry. I mean, cornerback for the Eagles is going to be, I'm trying to think of a comp from last year of of just, you know, you saw the same team taking the same position every single time. This is far and away the Eagles' number one need, and there's going to be players at this spot. It, it has played out well for them with the depth of this class, the players that are going to be here, where they're picking. So whether this is Kool-Aid or DeGean or Wiggins or uh, our next pick to the Houston Texans, uh, which is going to be Ken Kenyon Mitchell, this has to be a cornerback. Uh, anyone that watched the Eagles play this year understands that. Um, but then, yeah, the Houston Texans at 23. I'm going to trust that getting guys back healthy next year on the offensive line that group can shape up um and we're gonna invest in the secondary a little bit which is fine but old um and we're gonna take a corner Kenyon mitchell really feels like someone that um D'Amico ryan's will like he's quick as hell he's really good at off coverage quarters coverage which it's not that they spam that in houston but they definitely like to run it uh, he's physical and and i think the the tackling aspect of it D'Amico ryan's will really like they got to teach him kind of how to play press coverage a little bit more didn't do a whole lot of that at toledo but you got a little bit of time because steven nelson's still hanging out around there so uh houston gets a corner and then at number 24 with dallas I think this is a really fun pick. I went with Keon Coleman here, and, and he there's going to be a split in the draft community with him, and, and I don't even know fully where I'm going to land on Keon Coleman. I, I like him, um, but the, the big question with him is going to be separation ability, and can he be a number one wide receiver? And I think those questions are fair, uh, but you put him here in Dallas as the number two to uh, CeeDee Lamb, obviously. You know This gives you a, a pretty easy out for Brandon Cooks, who's getting expensive and older um, and out for Michael Gallup who who plays this role but just hasn't been able to get back to the guy that he was when they paid him um, and and Dak has loved to have these big bodied X wide receivers you know CD is so good at separating and being in the slot Keon Coleman can hang out on the outside and be Dak's back shoulder fade guy, the timing guy. Like there's so many things that Dak is going to thrive with, with a guy like Keon Coleman. And I think, you know, Dak can give Coleman a lot more accurate looks to potentially win a lot more of these contested catch looks. Um, not to throw Jordan Travis under the bus, but I, I did think he, he left Keon Coleman out to dry a lot of times and, and Coleman could have had a much better season uh, with some better quarterback play, like just straight up. So really like this fit for for Dallas and and it's weird that we're here again and playmakers feel like a need for them but I, I do think it I do think it is then we got the Miami Dolphins where we traded down I mean you kind of knew where this was going we're going to take an offensive lineman uh, focusing on the interior of this offensive line we're going to go with Graham Barton out of Duke uh, I think you know still more to learn about him but I think he could potentially carry five position flexibility which for a Dolphins team that has I mean, Barton has played some left tackles, so like this is kind of ideal, honestly, because you have Teron Armstead, but you know he's going to miss five or six games a year. So you could have Barton be your left guard or even your center, maybe. Um, but if if you need him to step out there and play left tackle, I think he might be able to do it in a pinch. So I uh, still got to get into the tape on Graham Barton, but a lot of people seem to like him. 
and this was the the target when we traded down. Uh, then we got Tampa Bay at number 26, staying in the state of Florida, and Latu Latu is still there. Um, just, you know, I think Latu has some injury concerns, and I think he has some kind of, like, upside and athletic question marks in terms of, like, you know, is, is he going to be more Derek Barnett or Claylon Farrell? Or is college tape's really good, but does he have the get-off and the speed and the bend to be a dominant number one edge rusher? I, I don't know those answers. Um, I, I will never have the official answers, but I, I, I need to get further into his evaluation. Uh, but what I do know is that I saw his game against USC when I was watching Caleb Williams, and he was unblockable. And Tampa Bay needs more pass rushers. They still do. Uh, Shaq Barrett is not getting any younger. We've been saying that for two years. Joy, uh, Joe Tryon Shranka has not really worked out. I like I like Yaya Diaby. He's still growing. Uh, but I, I see this as a big need and, and definitely a value here and a pretty easy pick for Tampa. Then we got the Arizona Cardinals at number 27. They can go in a lot of different directions. You took the wide receiver early. Uh, I don't think you need to draft a late first round offensive lineman here. I think they have other um, opportunities to improve the O-line. Uh, we're going to focus on the defense here for Arizona. And uh, I'm going to go with someone that's getting a lot of buzz that I have not watched yet. But Byron Murphy, uh, the pass rusher out of uh, the interior pass rusher out of Texas, the, the Cardinals' interior defensive line is a goddamn joke. I can tell you that right now. Their run defense was horrible. Um, their pass rush was non-existent from that um, part of the field. Uh, their edge rush group needs help too, but it looks like Byron Murphy might be the best defensive lineman available at this point in time. Uh, so pretty easy pick to march up to the podium for Arizona. Then we got Buffalo. Um, why not? We're going to go Xavier Leggett. And there's a couple wide receiver picks at the end of this first round mock on guys that I have not watched yet. Certainly could, you know, change my opinion on who's taking who and what order uh, these guys go in and all that. But what I do know is Xavier Leggett is like 6'4". He's 220-something pounds. He can run like the wind. And Josh Allen throws the deep ball as far and as fast as anybody in the league. But he hasn't had a guy like this to maximize on that. And Gabe Davis has at times, um, you know, been good in that role. But I think Xavier Leggett could be supercharged Gabe Davis. And that sounds really exciting to me. I don't know if his film is good enough to warrant a first round pick. We're going to see him at the Senior Bowl here. So, you know, we'll, we'll literally be back in like a week with bigger opinions on Xavier Leggett. But at this point in time, I've seen him going in the first round. I like the traits. Uh, let's throw him here for now. Uh, but this, this obviously could be uh, uh, like a Donnie Mitchell, who we're going to have as our next pick, or it could be Troy Franklin, Xavier Worthy, like that. We're still very early in the process to figure out kind of who this wide receiver should be. But I do know that it needs to be a wide receiver for Buffalo because Gabe Davis is, I think, leaving. Diggs might be leaving. Um, it's time to reinvest in the in the playmakers here for Buffalo. That, that was very much clear in that game against Kansas City. Um, then we have Kansas City at number 29. I hinted at this, but we're going to have a Donnie Mitchell um, get Patrick Mahomes a perimeter. Um, sounds like he's pretty fast. Again, I haven't gotten to a Donnie Mitchell's tape yet, but uh, certainly seems like a, a fit to me at this point in time. They have their kind of short to intermediate options, but um, they need someone more reliable than Marquez Valdez-Scantling on the outside, and I trust Patrick Mahomes and Andy Reid to make the most of, of an Adani Mitchell. Um, then at number 30, the Detroit Lions. With these last four picks, by the way, I'm just going with the Vegas odds or whatever. Um, but yeah, Detroit's going to fall in at number 30. Got to go corner here, man. It, this group is just not cutting it, especially on the outside. We're going to go Kamari Lassiter out of Georgia, who... It sounds like this dude is tough as nails. He's smart. Maybe not the most like physically gifted corner in the world, um, but that just screams Dan Campbell to me. Um, and I, I, you know, could be really good in this defense that demands a lot of physicality. So it seems like a good fit. Uh, then San Francisco at 34. This is where Tyler Guyton's going to come off the board. This is a, a player we've hinted at with a couple of these picks. Um, someone I'm really excited to see at the senior bowl how he holds up in these one-on-ones the reports are this dude has absurd athleticism at six seven 325 pounds 
Kyle Shanahan likes those guys. The, you know, Mike McGlinchey comes to mind. And uh, if he can get a right tackle like, like Tyler Guyton and maybe a long-term replacement for Trent Williams, who's one of the most athletic offensive linemen we've ever seen, seems like a pretty damn good fit for the Niners. Um, then we have the Baltimore Ravens, projected Super Bowl winner, uh, according to Vegas. And uh, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to throw in a guy that I watched and said, this dude is awesome. And this could age really poorly. This could age well. I don't know. All I know is I saw the tape as I'm watching Florida State's offense, and I'm like, Trey Benson looks insanely good. And I just wanted to throw him in here. It's the biggest need for the Ravens. They've built this incredible roster. I, I think first-round running back discourse it, it's it's changed over the years. I, I think running backs have become more valuable as there's less good ones nowadays because most of these great athletes are going to play wide receiver and corner and, and better paid NFL positions. So I think there's less great running backs available. Um, but I also think with the way the game has changed with more two shell and um, the run game has kind of made a resurgence. I, I think running back is more valuable. I mean, certainly Detroit is a team I was critical of for drafting a running back. They've made it worth their while taking him at 12. Um, but if you're taking a guy with the 32nd pick and it's a huge need for you, I think it can bring a lot of value. And I mean, think of that offense with an explosive running back like Trey Benson, who to me at Florida State looks and feels like Jonathan Taylor, six foot, 220 pounds a shot out of a cannon, a ton of contact balance. He's he's made as many, um, about as many missed tackles forced as like Bijan did. So like I praised Bijan Robinson, still the highest graded uh, prospect I've ever had uh, for essentially being close to a 50% rate of missed tackles forced on his carries. Like every other time he touched the ball, he was making one guy miss. That was an absurd clip. Trey Benson, over the last two years at Florida State, is not far behind. He has made 124 defenders miss on 310 attempts. Like, he does it in a different way. He's not as shifty as Bijan, but he's breaking arm tackles, and he's got a nasty stiff arm. This dude's insane, man. Um, I don't... I haven't heard too much about Trey Benson, but just having watched his film, and I haven't watched these other running backs really, so there might be other guys I fall in love with, but where I'm at right now, this dude is a player that I see incredible upside, and as long as his knee checks out, because he had a tragic knee injury that um, made him leave Oregon and kind of delayed his career here, um, but as long as that checks out, I definitely see a guy that uh, could could easily be a top 50 pick and, and could make the Ravens offense even more difficult to handle. So uh, going to end the mock draft on a fun one there. I'm, I'm excited to get some feedback on that one. Um, an early my guy, I think, in this draft. Uh, but uh, really fun mock draft. Always, always a good time getting through these. But the first one does hit a little bit different. So I really hope you guys enjoyed. Please do hit that like button on the way out. It, it just really helps me out, um, helps push this video out. You know, there's a million mock drafts. So uh, the more likes, the more people are going to be brought to this one. And I really appreciate that. Let me know your comments down below where you agree, where you disagree. Make sure you're subbed up. And we're out of here. We'll see you guys down at the Senior Bowl next week. Peace out. <laughs>